So tonight, we, we're gathered to commemorate a priest who, uh, as we probably know, was martyred 10 years ago. In fact, tonight, at 11 o'clock Moscow time, um, is around about when he was shot in his church. This is Father Daniel Sisoya, who you can see a, a, a close-up shot here. All of these photos, by the way, are courtesy of Google Images, so I apologize to their respect, respective copyright holders. Um, but Father Daniel, we, we're remembering him especially tonight because it was tonight that he was mortally wounded, and then in the wee hours of, uh, of Wednesday morning, again, Moscow time, it was, um, I think, about 10 minutes after midnight or 20, something along those lines, um, when he, he did die on the operating table. Unfortunately, with a martyrdom, there's really no way of, um, of dressing it up so it, it's, um, you know, it's, that it's any more cheery than it is. But with, um, with a martyrdom, we know something very important. We know that it is not, the, not for a Christian to grieve hopelessly. And for a person to die in martyrdom means that, if anything, we have the most hope. And so we, we grieve, and it is normal to grieve those who we lose. Just like we grieve when someone leaves, up, leaves us for a long journey, and we expect not to see them for many years. But we don't grieve without hope. Because we trust in our loving God that we will see them again. But the story begins much earlier with Father Daniel begins way, way back in 1974. I think Khrushchev was in power in the USSR. So this explains why it was that um, the future Father Daniel was born in 1974 and yet was baptized three years later. There was no influence from Tertullian. There was, there was no, uh, let's delay it for a little while because that's better, beneficial for the child. They were in fear. They were in a very real fear. Um, and the, the parents, indeed, were baptized after Father Daniel's birth, and yet their child was not. It was only when he had a, a great illness that they decided, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what happens to us. We're told that a person must be born again of water and the Spirit, and we are going to make that happen. And so at the age of three, young Daniel was, um, was baptized. Uh, and after that, he attended church. His father was a sacristan and, and served in the church. And so he had all sorts of opportunities to serve liturgically that were available to him. He, um, he continued to be in relatively ill health for, um, that was a lifelong condition. Um, he attended church, served liturgically, and dreamt of being a priest. He'd have towers for stoles and felonia, uh, and that's how he would play being a priest. Um, he, when he was in school, he was actually shamed uh, for being Christian. He was pressured to become a Marxist atheist, just like everyone else. Um, and keeping in mind that this was the late 70s and through the 80s. Um, and in, those, in, his, in his younger times, especially the uh, late 70s, early 80s, Communism hadn't gone anywhere. Marxist atheism hadn't gone anywhere. And uh, so he was sick one time, and his teachers came to his house, and they wanted to wish him well. And so they, they went into his room, and they'd never seen so many icons of religious books. Their whole demeanor changed, of course. Changed from smiling to uh, shock, and, uh, and actually blaming themselves. Because here, here was a child who had clearly been taught badly, and they were his teachers, um, because he was not a uh, Marxist atheist. And yet still, he said to his peers, to his teachers, that he was a Christian, that he learned prayers by heart, and that he was not ashamed of this. This would serve him very well uh, after the fall of communism as well, where he was never, ever, where he never yielded to pressure to be quiet for his Christianity. Uh, he completed secondary school in 91 and immediately entered the Moscow Theological Seminary. 
He was a student there. He was a chorister. He led a mixed choir in the uh, in the school for church choral conducting. I thought this was adorable. Sorry, I'm going to skip ahead. It's absolutely adorable. Uh, that's his marriage. And so, uh, a, a very young reader, Daniel. He was made a reader uh, about a month before he was married, and, uh, and his wife next to him, as as you expect for a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> he was married by um, a priest who is now the priest in Hong Kong. Um, they, they knew each other in early life and would have missionary conversations. Um, and they knew each other since day dot. And he, Father Dionysi, had the, um, had the honor of marrying um, Father Daniel and Matushka Yulia. He was ordained to the diaconate in 95. His first child was born later that year. That was a very big year. And uh, he was assigned to the Bulgarian Representation Church. That's what Metochio means. Um, to the Representation Church of, of the Church of Bulgaria. And then, and finally, he graduated from the Moscow Theological Seminary at the top of his class. Think of this as getting your bachelor's in theology. That's around about what you would, um, what you would expect from the Moscow Theological Seminary. And then he went on to postgraduate studies at the Moscow Theological Academy, which is like step two. Uh, so at the academy, he enrolled and eventually graduated from the, I'm probably pronouncing this poorly, uh, the Candidatura, which is a bit like a PhD. Probably a bit harder than a PhD, but somewhere along those lines. Uh, and, you know, it's pretty severe if it takes you five years to be able to do it, and that's kind of the standard length. So, um, and he did this by distance education, by correspondence, as it, as it was in the mid-90s. Uh, his thesis was on the Watchtower Society. It was on uh, the Seventh-day Adventists and the, their anthropology and an analysis of them. Uh, and that, that occupied his, um, his great big thesis. He was ordained to the priesthood very soon afterwards, assigned to a church in Yasinievo, uh, in, again in Moscow. So all, all of this time, his work is centered in Moscow, a very cosmopolitan capital with millions of people in it. I don't know how many millions, but more than any city in Australia, um, of many different cultures, many different languages, many different nationalities. Um, of course, the majority being Russian, but there being many overseas workers, there being many people from, from elsewhere. And of course, Russia's a big place. So um, just because you're from Russia doesn't mean that everything's the same east to west, north to south, and so on. Uh, and Moscow became a, a, quite a melting pot. And so that's part of the reason why his work is so relevant to us. Because a very similar set of circumstances, that cosmopolitan, um, that cosmopolitan ethos, the size of the city, that, um, and that there's a lot of people that have never heard the gospel before, and never heard of it in a way that they could accept. And he took that as a big thing. Now, from here, I, I need to divide his life into four big elements that I'm wanting to emphasize as part of tonight's talk. There's the uh, part that I'm clearly going to look at first, where, where we look at his role as an author and an apologist. A part where we look at his role as an evangelist where we look at his role as a pastor, and specifically a missionary pastor, a outwardly focused pastor. He didn't have a church where he was satisfied with the number of people who were there, with the group of people that were there, and this is fine. But he had an outward focus for his particular parish. And we'll also look at his martyrdom to, um, shouldn't surprise anyone, to conclude. So, his role as an author and apologist began in 1999. His first book was about, the, about creation, called The Chronicle of the Beginning. And it was published by uh, Sretinsky Monastery, dedicated to patristic thought, patristic, um, patristics about creation. And he wrote a, um, the Exaimeron against evolution. Exaimeron means six days. So, the... Uh, he, sorry, didn't write it, edited that book, and that was published in 2000. He would often write about creation issues um, and about, he also wrote on divine revelation and contemporary science discussing creation. This was one of his big issues that he would write a lot about. 
Other issues that he wrote a lot about included comparative religions and, of course, Orthodox Christianity itself. He was awarded a letter of commendation in the same year, in 2000, for teaching by the uh, Moscow Patriarchate's Department for Religious Education and Catechesis. In the mid-2000s, a few years later, he was invited to his first open discussion, um, which basically means a to-and-fro argument, not unlike the uh, political debates, um, to that first open discussion with Muslims. And this is something that he would repeat um, again and again. He was invited to many television shows, many radio shows. He had similar discussions with the pagan groups and various sectarian groups. Uh, by pagan groups, I'm, I'm pretty sure neo-pagan would be the more accurate term. Uh, he was noted for his performances. He was noted for how well he was able to articulate the Orthodox Christian response how well he was able to articulate the Orthodox Christian answer uh, and position on various issues. Uh, why it was that we should be Orthodox Christians instead of being sectarian, instead of being neo-pagan, instead of being Muslim, and so forth. This was around the time, the mid-2000s, that he received his first threats from, particularly from Muslims, um, and when he started receiving criticisms from uh, pagans and nationalists, oddly enough. We're going to look more at criticisms of him uh, later on because that does inform how, how it was that he was martyred. Many of his books, just as a side note, are now available, and many have been translated into English as well. So if you go to danielsisoya.com, then uh, you're able to look at his, at his books. Mission-Center, spelt, like, uh, spelt in the American spelling, T-E-R, um, you'll also be able to find his books. And the next, the next point I want to emphasize is his role as an evangelist. So as an evangelist, all that work started in 1993. This would have been when he was a second year or third year student in seminary. He hadn't even finished his bachelor's degree and, and there he was out there. Um, he received a blessing from the Patriarchate in '96 to hold missionary biblical conversations in in a um, in the Patriarchate of Tokyo with people who had suffered from the influence of sects of other faiths and who had suffered from the influence of occult activities. In '97, he would begin holding talks on the Bible specifically, and that continued for the next 12 years. Uh, he also began work at the Rehabilitation Center of St. John of Kronstadt. And then five years later, he was ordained to the priesthood, as we mentioned earlier. In 2001, he was ordained there. Um, he continued his previous work and also became the secretary for a missionary and educational center. This, uh, at this time, he started doing a lot of travel. Traveling around Russia, traveling around the post-Soviet states, um, which is generally the uh, CIS states. But he did a lot of travel preaching to Orthodox and to Muslims. Many turned to Christ. Many, many people turned to Christ. There's, um, there's a specific group in Russia that it blows my mind because I don't know how it's possible, but clearly it is, where you can have Orthodox atheists that are tied to um, being identifying as Orthodox Christians, but in actuality they don't believe in God. And so, um, well, this is one of the things that, that can happen, uh, and that did happen in that post-Soviet space, especially, because, uh, well, what other belief system are you going to turn to to provide your continuity in life? If you've seen the fall of communism, what's, what's in its place? But this is a mission field. This is already a mission field. And so Father Daniel was able to, to, uh, to tap into that and to bring people from saying that they liked the idea of Orthodox Christianity to be actually Orthodox Christians, to be actually following Christ. He also served as a professor at a seminary and, and he lectured in liturgics and missiology. He was very much noted for his active missionary work. He, was, um, he did a lot of work among Muslim and neo-pagan and Protestant communities in Russia. Um,
from the I've only seen two statistics for how success, if we want to define successful as baptized, which is not a great definition, but let's do that because we don't have any, any other options. He baptized 80 Muslims and 500 Protestants. That's what he was able to do. Um, then he was able to count, let alone anything else. Um, just the metrics that he could count. So he did a lot of work. He offered courses. He, was, he became so successful that others wanted to follow in his footsteps. And so he began offering courses in how to be a missionary. Um, how to preach the gospel on the street. On the streets of Moscow, you wouldn't, perhaps from, from here, we may think that the streets of Moscow would be relatively safe to preach the gospel. And there were benefits to being in Moscow. Um, people, for example, were, were much happier that it was an orthodox street preacher than that it was a, say, heterodox street preacher, someone from any other religion. Because they went, well, these are our guys. I can listen. I, I can talk to these people. Uh, and maybe they just needed to be called back to a more active church participation, which, which did happen for a lot of people. And he was able to coordinate their activity. He was very much motivated by the idea that everyone is called by the Lord to join his, as in God's, true church and inherit eternal life. And that everyone was called to this regardless of their national background regardless of their ethnic background, their cultural background, their political background. Because within the Orthodox Church, all nations become one nation in Christ. That doesn't mean that we lose our culture or that we lose ourselves or that we have to become some other culture. But rather that all these cultures become a single nation, a Christian nation. He wrote a the last um, thing, the last point to mention here, is that he wrote a letter to a number of non-canonical churches. You, we may have heard of, of of this idea of independent Christian churches, churches that have Orthodox in their names, or, or um, but they have no relationship to the actual Orthodox Church. And he actually wrote a letter to a lot of these um, denominations in America, saying, "Yeah, do you want to come home?" If you want to talk about being Orthodox, that means being Orthodox. That means becoming a part of a recognized group of people. And many actually responded really well. In fact, so many responded that they didn't have the resources to keep up, that they weren't able to, to respond properly. After all, they were working in a different language. Now that's very challenging. And they were actually recommended to join the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia is um, the jurisdiction that we're blessed to belong to. And many actually did. Even with the little amount of time that uh, Father Daniel had left at this point in his life, we're only talking the year of his death, um, still he was able to, um, to affect that change and to affect that, that impact on Orthodox life across the world. He was not only a evangelist. He was not only on the streets and, and traveling to, to far off places. But he had, a, he had a parish. He had a very special parish. This parish was a, um, was a parish that was intended for the conversion of non-Christians. And he knew that most of these non-Christians would probably be non-Russians. Kandemirovskaya district in Moscow is one where a lot of guest workers are living. Where a lot of people from various different nations are living. And because of that he saw an opportunity. He saw that he would be able to bring the gospel to them. There would be tracts in various languages for example. And the Moscow city government gave them land in this district for a church to be constructed to the prophet Daniel. Um, there was a temporary wooden church erected, and that was dedicated to the Apostle Thomas. It was intended that this church would serve its purpose, and then would be replaced by this gorgeous church. It, 
just looked amazing, modeled on a Byzantine basilica um, with inspiration from Sinai Monastery, and so on and so on. Um, as of 2016, the, um, the, the, the plans for the church had changed, and, um, and, yeah, and so they're still serving in that temporary church. There's been a number of difficulties in replacing that, that wooden church. Now, I mentioned in 2003 that there was a community of Tatars, and this is quite significant because Tatars don't consider themselves to be Russian, ethnically. It's a, a different ethnic group. Um, and one of the advantages that Father Daniel had was that he was half Russian, half Tatar. And Tatars de descended from the Mongols. And so there was a, um, I think that they eventually became Muslim and, um, and followed the Islamic faith. But he, because he was able to bridge that gap, he was able to speak to them. And, uh, and he was able to draw many into the true faith. Now this church did a number of things. This church had an open house quite frequently. Because when your church is in a good location, you're going to have a lot of foot traffic going by. And if your church looks half decent, then people are going to wonder what's inside. And so the church was open at various points, and the priest was available for questions at these points. Uh, they would hold frequent malevolence, frequent prayer services for particular needs, especially for the conversion of the non-Orthodox and for the students who were studying at a local, uh, local university. And they also promoted a number of cultural and religious initiatives among Chinese students in Russia. Father Daniel's work as a catechist no doubt was centered on his parish. And it's huge. He did so much work. And when you're considering the time period, which is the, um, the first decade of the 2000s, there was a lot of work to be done. And so he would deliver five talks every single week. On Thursday nights, he would do that Bible study. He would focus on how the saints and fathers interpreted the scriptures, and this would, be, this would attract inquirers, attract catechumens. It would even attract imams, uh, Muslim clerics. On Friday night, he would do catechism, specifically catechism, preparing people for bap a course that would prepare people for baptism. There would be five talks. It would be delivered in a cycle. One, two, three, four, five, and then let's start the series again. One, two, three, four, five. Um, and that would be done over Friday nights throughout the year. He'd talk about who is God. He'd talk about creation. He'd talk about salvation and the end times. He'd talk about what the church was and what baptism was. And five, he would talk about ethics and asceticism. So what should we do? What should we do in our life? So that's two talks. Both of them were two hours each. On the weekend, though, just as part of normal weekend services, he would deliver three sermons. At vigil, he'd deliver a sermon. It would be about, um, about the passions and about the virtues, and it would be about the saint of the day. One of those two things. Then at liturgy, after the gospel reading, he would deliver a sermon that was on the gospel itself. And at the end of the liturgy, he'd deliver a sermon that was about the epistle reading for the day. So that's quite comprehensive. Five talks every week. It's not me, babe. The parish also ran uh, missionary courses, as we mentioned, ran singing lessons, ran iconography classes, even ran a scout group. There were other fe uh, features as well. During clergy communion, he would have a reading from scripture. Now, there wouldn't be anything special about the reading of the day. It was com completely by chance. What would happen is that he'd start at Matthew 1, and you'd read until the doors opened, and then you put a bookmark. That's where you'd start reading next week. It was really that simple. Um, very, very practical, too. Near Christmas and Easter, he would give talks about the sacraments. Uh, parishioners would be invited. The newly baptized would be especially invited. And these talks would be tailored to his audience. 
Now, Father Daniel came under a lot of criticism for his work. There was a co-chair of the Council of Muftis in Russia that sued Father Daniel for writing a book containing expressions that were offensive to Muslims. A journalist accused him of inciting hatred of Islam and filed a legal suit against him. Neo-Nazi groups didn't like his views. Ultra-right-wing orthodox publications criticized him for not being a monarchist. Old ritualists considered his publications as slanderous. And he received a lot of death threats. According to his live journal, which tells you when this was, I can see your reaction. <laughs> live journal was, um, was a big thing in Russia long after it was in Australia. In Australia it kind of died in mid-2000 and Russia continued on. But it was when he was alive. It was the main place where, um, where people would, would be posting things. Um, I guess the contact hadn't gotten there yet. And he said on his live journal in October 2009 that he re had received 14 death threats. That's quite a lot, considering it only started in the mid-2000s. So you're looking at two or three a year. That'll wear on a man. He's got a wife and three kids. Not old kids either, three young kids. Since 2006, he had a, an impending sense of his martyrdom. He worked through his holidays. He even got a broken leg and didn't stop doing services. There's photos of him hearing confession. And, um, and you might be able to see a moon boot, but you can definitely see a crutch on the wall. And that was, that was for him. Um, and he didn't take any, any sick leave, like a, like a normal person would. Uh, he didn't take any holidays, he worked straight through. Because, because he himself had the sense that there's no time. There's not enough time to get, to get everything done that he wanted to get done. And sure enough, he was right. Because on 19th of November in 2009, between 11.10 and 11.20, he was shot four times by a Muslim fanatic. He also wounded the choir, choir director. And he died on the operating table about an hour later, aged 35 years. He was uh, survived by his Matushka and his three daughters, and was the 25th priest who had been murdered in Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. A month later, there was a militant Islamic group who took credit for his death. Patriarch Kirill called him a confessor of the faith and a martyr for the cause of evangelical preaching. Abbas Prosokia of Ormilio Monastery in Greece expressed many years ago now, expressed that he is a saint, saying that instead of praying for him, we should be asking for his prayers. <clears throat> He's got a huge impact for us today, and I've got a few minutes left, and I want to focus those minutes on his impact today. Because there's not much point just giving you a biography. Let's apply this now. He's a model to us. As I said before, he was preaching in a cosmopolitan city in the face of challenges from atheism and other faiths. What is it that we have in Australia today? Cosmopolitan cities with challenges from atheism and other faiths. Very, very similar. There are, of course, differences, but there are many striking similarities for a man from the other side of the world. He's an example of what one person can do. Not only personally, and we've seen some of the things that he was able to accomplish in his, in his life, but also through his legacy, through people following in his footsteps. And that's despite his youth. As far as priests go, he was incredibly young. The canons talk about how a, um, a man shouldn't be a priest before he's 30. Well, in that case, he didn't have much time to work with. He was very, very young. He's, he was starting off alone and spent much of, his, much of his ministry with not too many people around him. He spent his life with poor health. And he was asked, how do you find the time for all this? And he said, look, you've got to set the bar higher than you can possibly reach. It's for some reason, God blesses this. God blesses it when you set the bar higher than you can reach. He inspires, he continues his impact through his catechetical labors in post-communist Russia, teaching us to teaching us to teach all who wish to learn, being open 
to all people, all persons and all peoples. He teaches us in, by his example in apologetics, by first learning, he read voraciously. He kept on learning, kept on learning, kept on learning, and he was able to apply at a moment's notice. He first learned, and he had the courage to proclaim. And he was really on the forefront of missionary activity in the Russian Orthodox Church. In the 90s, possibly because of necessity, I wasn't there, but there was a great, great focus on not evangelizing. Perhaps by being overwhelmed with the number of people of our own that we needed to baptize. Let's not look at others, let's just, let's just fix this. But now, now there is a predominant acceptance that evangelism is a good thing, that evangelism is important, that evangelism should be done by someone. He gives us an example of individual evangelism, where it's one person going out, a group going out to tell people about the gospel. And he gives an example of how parishes are able to support that activity, are able to support evangelism, and able to support that through hospitality, through welcoming those people that have been evangelized and giving them a place. Welcoming them, giving them a place in the body of the, of the local parish, which is where people meet the church, capital C. And he emphasized that Orthodox Christianity is not just for our own, it's not just for our people, but is for all persons and for all people groups, including beyond the borders of his own country. He emphasized that, it, that the purpose of evangelism was not to convert to the Russian culture. It was to convert to Orthodoxy and to present this in the culture of the other person, in the culture that you are evangelizing to. As His Eminence, our Metropolitan, said, it is this type of well thought out and uncompromising witnessing that is so needed in our times. It's a new way of teaching that will reach and persuade the person in our day and age. And I'd like to conclude by giving a quotation from, from His Eminence, our Metropolitan, that I invite you, all of you, to share in the dream of Father Daniel, that the Gospel and the Orthodox faith be preached throughout the world, which is something quite topical and feasible today for all of us. And as he continues, he invokes God's blessing on all that are following in the example of Father Daniel, that is, our missionaries who are carrying on their work in different parts of the world as we speak, along with others who are carrying on his legacy. Thank you all very much for coming, for praying with us at our memorial service, and for hearing this talk in, in Father Daniel's honor. Um, if you've got questions up until 8 o'clock, I would love to, love to take them and, and try to answer them. Probably got time for three or four questions, I reckon. First one. On that letter they sent to America, mm. to those non Orthodox Orthodox churches, do they have that letter? Is I'm it sure that they do. <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> and I, I couldn't see it. In, in fact, it's not part of his normal biography. Mm. Um, there's, a, um, there's an evening, a memorial evening, that they had at Synodal headquarters in 2016, where I, I was able to take a number of um, number of factoids and, and include them in tonight's presentation and there was a lot that I didn't include because it just wasn't relevant to, to my particular topic. It must have um, been a remarkable letter. It must have been, yeah. yeah. Um, his books are like that. As well? So he's got a book called Law of God. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever I say Law of God, in, at least in uh, Russian tradition parishes, everyone's thinking of Father Seraphim Slobodskoy's Zakon Boji or The Law of God. Um, and Father Seraphim um, did his best to remove the author from the statistics, from the facts of the, um, of, the, of the book. 
and Father Daniel does the exact opposite thing. He's putting in personal anecdotes, he's putting in his personal, his, his personal touch. He, you couldn't take the author out of Father Daniel's writings, it just doesn't work. Um, he has such a way of presenting that, um, that is engaging. People now may not agree, but it's engaging. And I'm certain that that letter was written with, um, with the same kind of authenticity coming from him. Yeah. Sorry, I can't say yes, I've got the letter, um, but it would be incredible. Um, and of course it does lead one to wonder um, what might be if, if such a thing was attempted against. He hasn't been glorified though, right? So, so how do we have an icon with a relic? Because people make icons. Well, but I thought if they weren't glorified, then you were at least not yet supposed to put the... Yeah, you're not. Oh. <laughs> Just has. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, you're not supposed to say saint. Um, you're not supposed. You can say um, that here. Um, you could probably get away with martyr, but you're not supposed to say saint because um, he hasn't been glorified by the church yet. Um, my guess is that that's more just you wait for time to pass. That's the normal way of things. Um, but yeah, there's. Um, I kind of figure that if an abbess can say that we should ask for his prayers, then privately, there's nothing to stop us. Nothing to stop us anyway, actually. Um, but with that kind of imprimatur, uh, and with the, the imprimatur of the patriarch saying that this is a martyr for evangelical preaching, then, um, then privately, that's, um, that's an option that's open to us. Um, publicly, of course, we wait for the certification of the church um, because in that we're safe. Do you know if there is a relic in, in there or is it just waiting? I reckon it's waiting because I can't see any difference in color. No. We've got about five minutes and I've got one question for you. Oh, no. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? It doesn't work like that. I, I disagree. <laughs> So how can we apply Father Daniel's teachings in our parish today? Now I've said he was in a cosmopolitan city among different faiths and no faiths. And this is very, very applicable to us. I've talked about his role in apologetics. Um, I've talked about his role in catechism. I've talked about his role as a missionary and having a missionary parish. So, how would we be able to apply this to our li to our lives in Brisbane? Through your courses and our welcoming coffee hour. Mm. And if we know of people, like um, we talk to people, mm -hmm. um, you can mention your faith and. Uh, what background just um, you can talk to them briefly about the orthodoxy if they're interested you can invite them to come to the church and just explain briefly the importance of the religion and, and just see if they're interested and in whether there is something like friends of yours or acquaintances but finally of course the right moment <laughs> not to give them a feeling that you're a fanat fanatical person <laughs> who just wants like you know this Jehovah's Witnesses to convert people. I think for us ordinary people that's all we can do you know in terms of the, um, if you have a conversation with somebody you can just start a um, conversation about religion and just um, um, see what the person opinion is on that first yeah. and then explain them the importance but not being too pushy or not being too you know mm. There's nothing that's all about that. Mm. That's huge. That's a lot. That that's that's a very good thing and that's something that can that is achievable because we're told to preach the gospel to all na to all creatures. Uh, we're told mm. to make disciples of all nations. We're not told that we're going to be successful all the time. In fact we're told quite the opposite. And that's okay. It's a, sometimes people won't be interested, and that's fine. Well, Maybe they're example, going through something. For, that's for good. example, me, when I have conversations mm. of different groups of friends, and I have friends who are, mm. um, believe in God but don't come to the church, I have friends who are like, you know, all mm. sorts of kinds of people, it doesn't mean that they cannot be uh, my friends or acquaintances. Oh. But I like at times, you know, talk about my religion, where I go to the church, with church, um, and explain things to them occasionally, you know, mm. at times. So something like that we have. 
Absolutely. And maybe inviting a occasionally to come over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you see, if you sense that they're, they might be open to that, that's a very good thing to do. Whether to church or to a church event, to a Bible study, to, you know, there's, there's options. Books are good, that's very good. Giving books out. Books is very good. Works or mm -hmm. there. Pamphlets yeah. would be very good if we had them. I'm yeah. working on it. Um, but pamphlets are smaller, they're topical, you can give them away. But I think it's very important all, all, all this, like, you know, sometimes growing in Russia you see these families where these mothers or grandmothers keep pushing their children all the time to go yeah. to the church and even, you know, being really bad and nasty towards them, which yeah. is the worst uh, thing you can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, you shouldn't cross these borders of, like, not, you know, continuously no. <laughs> negatively pushing somebody and just... You can do something, but just in the end, just leave it to God's providence to do what's necessary to be done. You know, yeah. if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If not, like that, you know, also, but you've done whatever you could do. That's absolutely. Right. You can also refer them to YouTube channels. Uh, yeah. Possibly yeah. even Hayops mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People look at YouTube videos. Yeah. 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 And, and not just the channel, but a particular mm -hmm. video is yeah, often very, very helpful. Yeah. Do they have at school uh, lessons on Christianity in Australia? Mm -hmm. Go to school, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, mm -hmm. um, like Australian school. Not often. So when it's I did that, I did that for a number of years. But you, mm -hmm. looking at the success rate of did any of them end up going to church? Very, very small. Because it's not what happen, It's not that half hour per week in school that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. That's twenty hours a year. The school itself has 30 hours per week. <laughs> it's a drop in the ocean. It's a it? drop in the ocean when, when, when it's not supported at home. So um, the evangelization of children starts in the home, and parents have got to take the forefront of that. Well, it's, it's so important. It's so much easier for the country like Russia. People just so much aware of it. Mm. I feel mm. like it's difficult in this country. I can just imagine that there's. Um, it's not well known. No, no. no. That's, uh, that's what we've got to change. Yeah. Uh, any last ways that we're able to apply Father Daniel's teachings? Yeah, that does. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that actually helps you. It keeps the services going smoothly and allows yeah. other people to focus on, yeah. on the yeah. prayers. Yeah, yeah, I'm like this. One of the dot points that I missed mm -hmm. was, that, um, was Father Daniel's love for the divine services. So actually being there being at vigil, being at liturgy, is, is a huge step up. Um, that, that becomes a foundation on which anything else grows, on which missionary work grows, any kind of, um, any facet of missionary work, like evangelism and apologetics and catechism and so on, are all founded on the services. So um, having things go smoothly and in order is a very, very important thing. Yeah, last one. One, one, um, one very good summary, and it was delivered very well, I thought, was Metropolitan Jonah. He said if you invite one person each a mm -hmm. week or something, they did the maths, there'd be this many new people a year and yeah. all that, so it was just as simple as consistently inviting people yeah. for coffee or church. Or Absolutely. And delivered it in a, in a very straightforward way mm -hmm. um, to make it entirely believable. Because a lot of people are, oh, I can't do that, yeah. you know. And I want to admit that this, um, in Australia, it's much safer to do these things oh, yeah. um, because it's a very tolerable country to all sorts of yeah. <laughs> relatively people. Tolerable. <laughs> very tolerable. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, it's always a bit of a gamble when you decide to do something different. Um, and I'm very, very happy to have, to have shared uh, tonight with you. Thank you all again. Thank you. And let's close with prayer.